Uh, I prepared some problems by way of review. Um, you know, I just wanted to cover the basic theory. Um, this first problem here on product rule, I'm not going to go over because product rule is pretty standard and, you know, it's going to come up. Obviously, product rule is one of the basic um, techniques. I will mention with regards to this problem, you know, to recognize that it's a derivative problem and to recognize you have a product and to use product rule. And then to know the derivatives of the trig functions. That is one thing I'll say. If you haven't memorized your derivatives of the trig functions, that's something that's useful. You know, we, we don't have time to think about what's the derivative of secant. You know, we have to know automatically that the derivative is secant of tan. Um, let me talk about this chain rule problem. So for this chain rule problem, you know, for me, when I look at this function, what I see is on the very outside, I see this cube function, and then I see a sine function, and that's one composition, but then there's another composition here where inside the sine function, I have this cosine function. So basically, there should be as many derivatives as there are compositions. Here, there's three compositions. The cosine is inside the sine, which is inside the cube, there's three functions here, so we should see three derivatives. And you know we're going to peel the onion, start from the very outermost function. So I take something cubed and differentiate that. Some, the derivative of something cubed is three times something squared, which is what we have here. So at this point, we've gotten rid of this outer function, the cubed function. So then I move to the next function, take the derivative of sine of something. The derivative of sine of something is cosine of that thing. And so now I've you know, gone through yet another layer of this function. And finally, the innermost layer, take the derivative of cosine here. I've memorized the derivative of cosine's negative sign. There's my chain rule. I've you know, peeled the onion. I've gone through all the layers. Um, and then finally, at the end, is just cleaning up, putting the terms together, putting the minus sign in the front, that type of thing. Of course, chain rule is very important. It's not you know, it, it's not, will there be, yeah, there definitely will be a chain rule question, there, there, for sure, because it's so important. Um, the next thing that's very important is implicit differentiation. And so here, just let me remind you the theory, here is we know y depends on x. We know y is a function of x, but we don't know the actual explicit function, the formula for the function. We do know, however, that y also satisfies an equation. So in this case, we're given this equation, x squared y plus 2x equals 2 minus tangent of y squared. We can, in theory, use the equation to fulfill the input-output relationship. For each x value, in theory, we can solve for y. So to find y prime now, we start with the equation. And the thing I really want to emphasize here is this is an equation that has a left-hand side and a right-hand side, and we're going to be working on both sides. And we have to always be aware of what's happening on both sides. So what I need to do here is take an x derivative of both sides. And so if we you know, carefully look here, x squared times y, you should think y is a function of x. So this is x squared is a function of x, y is a function of x, this is a product of functions of x. So for that derivative, we're going to use a product rule, which is what you see here. The derivative of x squared is 2x times y plus the first function I copy down is x squared, and then the derivative of y is dy dx or y prime. You can write either y prime or dy dx, they're the same. So it's just a matter of style. So here, um, dy dx and y prime are the same thing. And so, <clears throat> so if you don't like to write these y primes, no worries, you can change that to a dy dx, and that's the same thing, okay? And so as far as algebra goes, we're done with the, I mean, as far as calculus goes, we're done with the calculus part. Now comes the algebra, and you know, quite frankly, this is where, you know, it's, people tend to make mistakes. What I now want to do is combine all terms that are attached to y prime. I want to combine those terms. So I want to move this x squared y prime, or actually I'm going to move this negative secant squared y squared 2y y prime to the other side so that it becomes positive. And anything else that does not have a y prime attached to it, so the 2xy and the 2, 
I'm going to move that to the other side. So we've got y primes on one side, everybody else on the other. So here you can see on the left hand side, both terms are being multiplied by y prime. So I'm going to factor this y prime out and isolate it. So when I factor the y prime out, it's right here. Here's the y prime factored out. And then divide both sides by this term, x squared plus secant squared at y squared 2y. And so there's my final answer. So this procedure is very important. There is an implicit differentiation problem on the test. Um, and there's, you know, it also comes up in related rates. So this procedure is important. It's chain rule at the end of the day, you know, and a little bit, the notation sometimes can get confusing. That's why practice is really important. The more you practice with it, the better it gets. The mind starts to appreciate it and it makes more sense to the brain. Um, so this problem was on quotient rule. I'm not going to go over quotient rule, but I am going to tell you that there definitely is a quotient rule problem. So do what you will with that information. You absolutely, I would say, have to memorize the quotient rule. Anyway, quotient rule comes up again, actually, in a problem here later. So I'll go over quotient rule at that point. But definitely, quotient rule is important. And I'll just flat out tell you, there is a quotient rule problem on the test. Um, so here, I want to do this linearization problem. <clears throat> so the problem says, um, find the linearization of f of x equal to sine of x at x equal to zero and use it to approximate the sine of negative 0.4 radians and the sine of 0.4 radians. And then it asks about the error. Specifically, it asks, are these approximations overestimates or underestimates? So the first thing you know, I would say is that this problem is important because linearizations and tangent lines are the same. And so however you want to think about it, you want to call it a linearization, you want to call it equation of the tangent line, whatever you want to call it, at the end of the day, it's imperative that you know the equation of a tangent line. The f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a formula. And here, you know, here we should know also how to use this tangent line equation to, to approximate the function. I don't know, maybe we should call it a tangent linearization. I don't know if that makes it better or worse. But like I said, the tangent line problem conceptually motivates calculus and, and linearization is a really important application. So it's just an important thing to know. So yes, once we know that this is the equation we're looking for, here we're given a is zero and the function is sine of x. So now I'm just finding the components. I'm finding the derivative of sine evaluated zero and I'm you know, evaluating sine at zero. And so here, you know, I, I would warn you to make sure you know your unit circle. You know, if someone says sine of zero equals one, that's wrong and that's gonna cause issues, you know? So make sure you know your unit circle, your basic trig stuff. That's where the errors tend to happen, not so much the calculus. And again, here, I mentioned this before, we need to know the derivatives of our trig functions. And so here I've memorized the derivative of sine of x is cosine of x. And then we evaluate it at zero. And here again, you know, cosine of zero, we need to know our unit circle is equal to one. So here, the linearization is quite simple. Uh, the linearization ends up being um, just x, basically. L of x equals, after we do the math, just x. So here for x near zero, I'm approximating sine of x with x. And so now we found the linearization, so that would be one part. Now here, let's do the actual approximation. So in the theory, what we're approximating is the function. And so here, the way we use the linearization is, if there's some f of x, that's where x is near a, I'm gonna, instead of using f of x, I'm gonna use l of x. So here, sine of negative 0.4, is the same as f of negative 0.4. And now I'm going to approximate f of negative 0.4 with l of negative 0.4. But now l is a very simple function. l of x is just x. So here l of negative 0.4 is just 0.4. So that's our approximation for sine of negative 0.4 radians. And then similarly, for sine of positive 4 radians, I do the same thing. And you, know, you get this approximation. Um, the next part of this has to do with underestimates and overestimates. 
And it's really important to kind of, you know, I think sometimes the language makes it seem overly complicated. Here, look at the graph here. So there'll be some words here, but here, just start by looking at the graph. At the end of the day, the graph tells the whole story. So what's the story? The story is I'm trying to find, for example, this number right here that's on the curve. But I, but I can't, for example, sine, I just can't calculate sine of 0.4, you know, or maybe it's too expensive or whatever. So instead, I find the tangent line at zero. I find the tangent line at a point close to 0.4. And I use this value instead of using the value on the curve. That's the whole story of linearizations. It's the tangent line problem plus something we can actually do with the tangent line. You know, use it use tangent line values instead of the actual value of the function. So here, if you draw the tangent line, you can see the approximation is above the actual. So our approximation of sine of 0 0.4 being 0 0.4 is an overestimate. And similarly, on the other side, you can see, I'm trying to find this point on the curve, but due to resource restrictions, I'm having to settle with this point on the tangent line. And that's fine. You know, this difference here in the height is called the error. If that height is small, then this is perfectly fine to use this approximation. In this case, you can see our approximation lies below the target we're trying to hit. So in this case, the approximation that sine of negative 0.4 is equal to negative 0.4, that's an underestimate. And here, you know, this is purely coming from looking at the graph and just comparing where does the point on the graph lie in relation to the point on the tangent line for that same fixed x value. If it's above, it's an overestimate. If it's under, it's an underestimate. So while I'm here, I also put this linearization problem on here, not just to practice linearizations and underestimates and overestimates, but there's an interesting thing we can notice here. If x is near zero, then I can approximate sine of x as x. And now for this equation, if you divide both sides by x, we get the equation that for x near zero, sine of x over x is approximately one. And so basically what we're saying is numerically, we've essentially are sort of verifying this result. This isn't a proof here, but this is numerical verification that the limit of sine of x over x as x goes to zero equals one. We had proved this you know, using geometry before, but here this is kind of a numerical verification that that's true. It's not necessarily a proof, but it is you know, uh, an experiment that's confirming what we've proved. Um, like I said, either linearizations or tangent line problem will be on the test. You have to know this equation. You have to know this equation. Okay. Um, so this here is a classic differentials problem. So every differentials problem goes like this, where you're starting with some original value. In this case, it's uh, one millimeter. And then the value changes. In this case, the new value is 0.9 millimeters. So here are decreased. And so now we're asking, well, if the radius changes, how is that going to affect the volume of our sphere? Obviously, we expect the volume of our sphere to decrease. But exactly by how much will it decrease? So here, what we want to know is how will, how will the volume change? OK, so I just want to review this theory a little bit because sometimes the differential seems mysterious. So your delta v is v of a plus r minus v of a. So what is that? v of a plus delta r, excuse me. v of a plus delta r, that's the volume at the new value. So here, a plus delta r would be 0.9 millimeters. Minus v of a, a is the original value where we started out with here. So this all starts with us trying to approximate v of a plus delta r minus v of a. And so now we claim the approximation can be done. We can approximate this change, V of A plus delta R minus V of A, 
using this random formula, V prime of A times delta R. So now this is the part I want to show you that I think is important, that the formula actually is not random, right? The formula, I'm just making some room here so I can write some stuff down. The formula actually comes from our limit definition of the derivative. So here, if I put a fraction bar here, and if I take the delta R and move it underneath, so let me write a delta R here. Actually, let me do this. I'm going to first get rid of the delta R on this side because it's going to move. So let me get rid of this delta R. And now let me put it under here. So I moved it under here. Delta, oh my God. Color here. Here's a delta coming for you. The most perfect delta ever drawn. Sweet, sassy, fancy. I don't know. Anyway, so now if we take the limit of this thing as delta R goes to zero, all we get is the definition of the derivative. So, you know, you should think about this limit of V of A plus H minus V of A over H as H goes to zero. The left-hand side is exactly when you send delta R to zero is equal to the derivative. But now we're not, we're not actually taking a limit. Now what we're doing, instead of taking a limit, so I'm gonna get rid of the limit, what we're doing is we're just taking delta R to be a very, very small number close to zero, you know, not going to zero, but just a small number. And now if we move the delta R over, you get this formula that we call a differential. If I take this delta R and move it over here now, I get this approximation right here. And this thing is exactly what we call a differential. You know, it's literally the derivative and the, and the denominator from the limit definition on the other side of the derivative moved over, you know? And so that's what, we're all, that's what we need to calculate here. That's all this problem is asking for. Of course, you wouldn't have to explain all this theory. This is a review, and so I'm trying to review it. You would just figure out the differential. So here, basically, here's, here's the main information we're really interested in. For this problem, I would calculate the differential. So I know V prime is four pi R squared. I need to know this formula that the differential is V prime times delta R, where A is always the original starting value. So here I calculate the, the differential. So here, this part, that's the main thing here we're looking for. Okay, that's the differential, four pi R squared delta R, and now calculate delta R. So delta R is always the new value minus the original value. So here, it went from originally 1.0 to 0.9. So I do 0.9 minus 1.0 gives me the delta R. So now we're in business. The only other thing I'll mention is right here for A, we always plug in the original starting value. So you can see in this expression here, I'm now plugging in stuff. So here's delta V, which I'm gonna approximate with V prime of 1.0 times delta R. And so, you know, V prime of 1.0 is four pi times one squared delta R was negative 0.1. And so here's our approximation in the change. So here we know the volume is gonna decrease, that's what the minus sign tells us, by 0 0.4 pi millimeters cubed. So this part is important. Let me also mention how you state your answer. Look, I can either say the volume changes by negative 0.4 pi millimeters cubed, or I can say the volume decreases by 0.4 pi millimeters cubed. What I'm not saying is it decreases by negative 0.4 pi millimeters cubed. That would be a double negative. So this part's important and the language is important here. Okay, so pay attention to that part. The other part of this question asks for the relative change. You know, so my question now is, is negative 0.4 pi a lot or a little? Did the volume, I understand it changed exactly negative 0.4 pi, you know, approximately negative 0.4 pi, but in the grand scheme of things, is that a lot or a little? So here, what we're looking for is the relative change relative to the original. And this formula goes back to a formula from algebra, you know, back, I don't know, middle school. It's where you have a number 
and the number changes, and now you want to calculate the percent change, right? So the formula was you take the new value minus the original value divided by the original value. If you want percent change, you multiply it by 100%. So here, we're just looking for the relative change. So here, the new value is V of A plus delta R minus V of A divided by the original values V of A. This is where differentials comes in, where instead of actually calculating this numerator, we're like, eh, let's not calculate this numerator, let's just approximate it with differentials. And so that's where this weird formula comes up, comes from for the relative change. But it's really just new value minus original value divided by original value. And now I plug in all the numbers and do the math here. Again, the A is the original A that we started out with. So here A starts at one millimeter. And I get the relative change is negative 0.3. So you can interpret as it's decreased by 0.3 times. Or another way, if you want to talk about it in terms of percentages, we can say the percent, the relative change would be negative 0.3 or the percent change would be negative 30%. So here I multiplied 0.3 by 100%. Or we could say the volume decreases by 30%. I don't say the volume decreases by negative 30%. And so here, here, yeah, negative point, a decrease of 0.4 pi is quite a lot. It's a 30% decrease. So yeah, relative to the whole, that's a major change. And that might be something we're concerned with, you know, if this happens in the context of shrinking or expanding of some, um, you know, trusses or joints, you know, mechanical object. I don't know, I'm not an engineer. Um, so yeah, this basic application of differentials is important. And I think it's you know important not to make it too complicated. It is a very straightforward idea that completely comes just from the limit definition of the derivative. It's just that with the words, the terminology, and sometimes the notation, it can kind of start to get confusing. You know? So yeah, differentials, I'll say, you know, that's a good topic to know. So this problem is really about critical points. I, I say find horizontal tangents and vertical tangents. At the end of the day, it's really about critical points, you know, because that's how you find horizontal tangents and vertical tangents, by identifying first what are the critical points. So, and then I also ask about differentiability. So here um, we're taking a derivative and for critical points, remember the critical points have to be in the domain of the function. So I just take a second to think about the domain of the function and ask about restrictions. Since this is an even root, we can only take the root of a non-negative number. So now for the product, uh, for the derivative. So it's really important that you see a product rule here and for the first function for x, the derivative is just one, no problem. For the second function, it's very important that you see a composition. There's the inside function, which is six minus x. And then there's the outside function, which is being raised to the one half power. So here I need a chain rule. And if I have a composition, that means chain rule. So my product rule here, I do plus, and I copy down the first function times and now here's this chain rule. The derivative of something to the one half, you can see we brought down the one half, subtract one from the exponent, that gives me a minus one half of the exponent, times the derivative of the inside is a negative one. So this, again, this is the calculus part. It's the next steps. I'm always curious what the students are gonna do. You know, so this is the calculus part and most, Every, we typically, this part every, goes okay. It's this next part. So here's what I hope folks will notice, that this is a fraction. And so here, there's still algebra to be done. Here, I have a difference of two terms where one of the terms is a fraction. So let me combine them. So I'm going to multiply top and bottom. I'm going to multiply this function, six minus x to the one half, top and bottom, by two times six minus x to the one half. So in the numerator, I get a two, and then six minus x to the one half times six minus x to the one half is the six minus x. And now I distribute the two and simplify, and then we get an expression of the derivative that's really useful. You know, here, either this form, either form is good. I just factored out the term because I know I'm going to be looking for, for, for the zero, but you don't have to. 
you know, either form is simplified and looking good. So now, why do I say this is useful? Because now I can look at this function and I know a fraction will be zero when its numerator is zero. And I can clearly see the numerator will be zero when x equals four. And a function will be undefined when the denominator is zero. So here I can see the denominator will be zero and x equal to six. So I'm identifying these points as critical points, x equal to four and x equal to six. And here at x equal to four, the derivative is actually equal to zero. So I know there's a horizontal tangent. Remember a horizontal tangent is just another term for your slope is zero. So I check the slope is actually zero at you know, x equal to four. And here for a vertical tangent, this is when the limit blows up to infinity or minus infinity. So here I check the limit as x goes to six from the left because of the domain. And I check here, and here I believe I have a typo. If I plug in the six in the denominator, so here you get a number over zero when you plug in. So now the question is, is it plus or minus infinity? I believe it should be minus infinity. So in the denominator, if I plug in a number like 5.9, for example, so I'm looking at numbers to the left of six that are less than six. So if I plug in 5.9, the denominator is positive, but the numerator is negative. So this limit should actually be a negative infinity. This plus symbol is wrong. My bad, y'all. So anywho, uh, you know, mistakes happen. You know, when I wrote this slide, it didn't come out like this correct right off the bat the first time. What you don't see is the number of times I'd go back and fix the slide and refix it and refix it, you know. So here, this plus infinity should be a minus. And just when we do math, we should always get in the habit of just checking our own work. Do a couple of steps, go back and check your work. Do a couple of steps, go back and check your work. It's kind of like writing code. You don't want to write too many lines of code before you compile it because you, you don't want the errors to, to kind of snowball. So you want to write a line of code, run it and see if it works. Write a line of code, run it, see if it works. And it's kind of the same thing. And I mean, it's because computer science comes from math, right? So it's not coincidental. Um, so here we've verified there's a horizontal tangent x equal to four and a vertical tangent x equal to six. You know, and I do want to mention that for critical points, they have to be in the domain of the original function. So that was something I was also checking. And so here's the critical points discussions that since the derivative is zero or undefined at four and six, and since they're in the domain, those are the critical points. So we have critical points at four and six. And then finally, in terms of differentiability, I'm looking at the derivative and asking, for what values of x will the derivative exist? Again, you know, demystify the, the word differentiable. Where is the function? Where, can, where will we be able to differentiate the function? Where is the function differentiable? Where is, does its derivative exist? So if you look at the derivative, the derivative exists for all values of x, except, you know, as long as x is less than six. Because of the even root, we can't have any negative numbers. And because it's in the denominator, it can't be zero. So here, if x is less than six, I quickly check the original function. The original function is continuous. The derivative exists for all x less than six. So it'll be differentiable for all x less than six. You know, remember, anytime someone talks about differentiability, remember that continuity is a prerequisite for differentiability. We cannot have differentiability without continuity. So, so continuity is something I'm checking in the back of my mind. And how do I check continuity? I'm asking about the domain of this function. I'm asking if I take a limit, can I find the limit just by plugging in numbers? And here, if you're in the domain, that's certainly true. So critical points are, are, will be important on the test. So a nice place where critical points show up is in the absolute maximum problem. And I do do an absolute extrema problem. And, and you, you know, I'll, I'll show you that, but we'll see critical points again. And I think that problem involves a quotient rule. So we can also go over the quotient rule there real quick. Um, so here's a related rates problem. Everyone's favorite. We all love related rates. 
Remember, there's only one related rates problem on the test, so don't worry too much about it. For me, related rates is really about cataloging the information accurately. What are we given? What are we trying to find? And now let me find a formula that relates those two things. So the related rates problem on the test, if there is one, the picture will be given to you. Okay, so here I'm showing you this slide with the picture. So the, the problem says that there's a balloon 500 feet away from a laser radar, also known as LADAR or LIDAR. So sometimes called light radar. So LADAR can be used to do three-dimensional imaging, uh, which I guess is really not important for this problem. But anyway, so a balloon that's rising from the ground is being tracked by a LADAR 500 feet away. And so we've got the picture here. So we're told that when the angle of the laser is pi over four radians, the rate of change of the angle is 0.13 radians per minute. One thing I always want you to really use are the units. So here I know 0.13 is a derivative from the units, radians per minute. And here radians are the angle, you know, are the unit of angle. So for this angle theta, they've told us what d theta dt is, because that's the rate of change of this angle. So now there are two questions here. The first question is how fast is the balloon rising at that moment? You know, so this balloon, when it starts out, it might be going up at a slower speed. And then as it starts to get a little, you know, lift, it might start to go faster. So we're not necessarily sure if the balloon's speed is constant, but they're asking us to find the speed at this specific moment when the angle is pi over four. So remember, the angle starts out at zero and slowly increases as the balloon rises up. So here's the part where I said, I think this is about cataloging the information to make a list of what we're given and what we're trying to find. And I'll, I'll read the second question in a second. So here we're given theta is pi over four radians. And we're also told at that moment, d theta dt is 0.13 radians per minute. Look at the units, you know, this is really important. Now here's the other part of cataloging, figure out what they're asking for. So this is how fast, right there we know it's asking for a derivative, how fast is the balloon rising? So we know the height of the balloon is given by y. When the balloon rises, y will increase. So this is another way of asking how fast will the variable y increase? Or what's dy dt? What's the rate of change of the y variable? That directly is related to the height of the balloon. So this is, to me, the most important part of a related rates problem, cataloging the information you're given and the information you're trying to find. I want to know where I'm coming from and where I'm going. So now the second part here of the analysis, now I want to find a formula that relates theta and y. Not d theta dt and dy dt, but just theta and y. To get to the ddt part, we'll take a derivative. So if you look at the diagram, there are many options here. I want to use the equation that's the simplest. I could use, for example, if I did sine of theta, and of course now knowing all your definitions of trig functions, of course, is important. If I did sine of theta, which would be opposite over hypotenuse, I would unnecessarily be involving the z variable. And when I take a derivative, I'd have to think about the derivative of the z variable as well. And in fact, for the derivative of y over z, since they're both functions of t, you'd have to use a quotient rule. So here, you know, if you look at it a little bit, we, we come upon tangent. Notice that tangent is the opposite, opposite over the adjacent, and it'll involve theta and y and no other extraneous variables, which is what we want. So I've got my variables of interest, theta and y, and no other extra unnecessary variables. So now take a derivative. So again, you know, I want to remind you we're doing implicit differentiation here. We're doing chain rule. Here, theta and y are functions of another variable t, time. So tangent of theta of t, that's a, that's a composition. So I need to do a chain rule. My derivative of the outside derivative of tangent 
is secant squared, you just copy down the theta, times the derivative of the inside. The derivative of theta with respect to t is d theta dt, or here you could write theta prime. You know, there's no ambiguity here. You could write d theta dt or theta prime, just depends what your style is, what you like to do. On the other side, the one over 500 is a constant, so we just pull it out. And then the derivative of y is literally just d dt of y or dy dt. And again, you can write that as y prime with the understanding that the prime is referring to a derivative with respect to time. Which remember, a related rates problem, everything is evolving in time. There's a, there's a timer that started here. The balloons start to go up, you know, and now we're kind of working in that framework. So now all I have to do is isolate the dy dt and plug in the given information, the pi over four, the 0 0.13. And so that's what I do here. And again, here, one piece of important thing is we need to know our unit circle. We need to know what secant of pi over four is. So secant of pi over four is the reciprocal of cosine of pi over four, which is root two over two, flip that over, it's two over root two or just root two. And you square that, so you get a two right here. And then I finish up the math here, you know, two times 500 is a thousand times 0.13. I move the decimal three places, I get 130 feet per minute. So, you know, to me, once you catalog the information, that to me is, is the tricky part. Then we find a, a formula relating the two and then take a derivative and solve for what's unknown. Here, I wanted to do a second problem just to show you something different because it's supposed to be review. So the second part says, Suppose the balloon's up, upward velocity is constant. So like I said, there was no reason for us to believe the balloon's velocity is constant. You know, it's conceivable that starting out, it's a little bit slower. And then what, for whatever reason, as it gets more lift or whether reasons it might, you know, move up faster. In Roman numeral part two here, we're now being asked to assume the velocity is constant. And then they say, how is the distance between the laser radar, the LIDAR, and the balloon changing when y equals 1200 feet. Again, you know, it's to me, it's really important that we catalog the information. So here, we're now going to assume dy dt is constant. And in the previous part, I found dy dt. If dy dt is a constant, then it has to equal 130 because I found the velocity at some point in time in the previous part was this constant, was this number 130. And if we're now being told dy dt is, is a constant, it's got to be 130 so, so it matches up. So here, I assume dy dt is a constant, so I assume dy dt is equal to 130 feet per minute. That's part of what's given. And the distance between the laser and the radar is this distance right here. We are asking about in this problem this distance. The distance between the radar and the laser is exactly given by the variable z. So how is the distance between the laser radar and the balloon changing? That word changing tells us it's a derivative. They want us to say something about dz dt. Find dz dt. And so now I just need a formula that relates z and y. And in this case, given the triangle, you know, it's, it's the Pythagorean theorem. And there's only one other issue here when we take the derivative. Now here, you know, make sure we're doing our implicit differentiation and this makes sense to you. The derivative, remember here, this is y of t squared. So obviously the derivative of the constant is zero, so that goes away. The derivative of y squared, the derivative of the outside is 2y times dy dt. dy dt is the derivative of the inside. Similarly, for z squared, we have 2z dz dt. And I'm solving for the dz dt. And so I get dz dt equals y over z times dy dt. And so now we have one tiny little problem that um, I know dy dt, that's 130. We're told to find dz dt when y equals 1,200. So I know y. I know y up here is 1200. The only thing I don't know is z. So here we have to do a little bit of extra work to find z. And, you know, to find z is just algebra. There's no calculus here. I'm going back to the Pythagorean theorem and I'm replacing y squared with 1200. 
And so we get 500 squared plus 1200 squared equals z squared. And this turns out to be your 5, 12, 13 Pythagorean triple. So uh, here, this could be 500 squared plus 1200 squared equals 1300 squared. So I'm able to conclude z is 1300. Plug all the numbers in, do the math, we get our final answer. So, you know, the cataloging of the information at the beginning is really important. And the, if there's a related rates problem on the test, there is, you'll be given the diagram, you know, and basic formulas you should know. Area of, um, a, you know, like a rectangle, um, area of a circle, circumference of a circle, um, area of a circle, um, you know, those basic formulas. Did I, did I mention area of a circle? Those basic formulas you should know. So here's a mean value theorem problem. That's a little more complicated than the one that's on the test. So on the test, it's a very standard mean value theorem problem. You know, mean value theorem is kind of out of place. It's totally random. We actually use it in chapter four, section 4.3. So here, I just wanted to put a slightly interesting problem, but the problem on the test is very, very straightforward. You should know the hypothesis of the mean value theorem. What, what requirements do we need of a function before we can apply the mean value theorem? And then you should know the statement of the mean value theorem. So remember, we need f of x to be continuous on the closed interval a, b, and differentiable on the open interval a, b. If that's true, then there exists a number c in the open interval a, b, such that f prime of c equals f of b minus f of a over b minus a. You know, just like I just blurted it out just now, you should just know it, okay? So for this problem, I just wanna do something a little more interesting because all these mean value theorem problems are so boring. So here we have a runner who completes a 6.2 mile race in 61 minutes. So we're asked to prove that based on this information at two points during the race, the runner's speed was exactly six miles per hour. And, and you know, here we assume that after the runner finishes running the race, they stop running. So their speed is zero. So here, if I assume S of T is the position of the runner as a function of time T in hours. So first of all, there's one trick they're trying to mess with us. The speed is given in miles per hour, but this is given in minutes. So right off the bat, I'm, I'm gonna standardize and make everything hours. Okay, so that's one thing right off the bat I'm, I'm paying attention to. So then the information we're given is S of zero at the starting time of T equals zero, the position the runner hasn't started running yet is zero. 61 minutes later, or 61 over 60 hours, the runner has finished the 6.2 mile race. So S of 61 over 60 equals 6.2. So your slide might say V right here. I found this typo this morning and I corrected it. It shouldn't be V, it should be S. And so now we assume that the position function is a continuous and differentiable function that the runner runs the whole time, doesn't start and stop, doesn't, you know, that the function is nice and continuous and differentiable. And so that the intermediate, I mean, the mean value theorem, there's no intermediate value theorem on this test. The mean value theorem will apply on this interval from time zero to time 61 over 60 hours. And so the mean value theorem will say there exists some time C in between the start time and end time of the race, such that S prime of C equals S of 61 over 60 minus S of zero over 61, you know, uh, divided by 60. So now this part's a little weird. And so, you know, this part's a little more complicated, you know, and you shouldn't worry about this, like something like this showing up on the test. So here, what I want to do now is compare this number to six miles per hour. And I'm gonna, you know, there's no calculators allowed. So for me, part of the challenge was how can I do this without using a calculator? I wanna think analytically. So the 6.2, I write as 62 divided by 10. And if you're dividing by 61 over 60, that's the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. So I multiply by the reciprocal. And now the 61 and the 10, I interchange. I write this as 61, 62 over 61, times 60 over 10, that gives me this expression. And so how is this useful? Well, 62 over 61 is bigger than one. So I'm multiplying six by a number bigger than one 
So I know 62 times over 61 times six will be larger than six. So what? Well, what we've concluded here is that, you know, remember that S prime is the velocity. So we've concluded here that at some point in time, the runner's velocity was greater than six miles per hour, it was more than six miles per hour. So the runner, while running, speeding up to get to that speed would have hit six miles an hour while speeding up. And then at the end of the race, when they slowed down, they would have also hit the speed of six miles per hour. You know, so at least two times during the race, we would have seen the runner hit a speed of six miles per hour. It seems pretty random, but there actually is a use for this. I believe it's, it's fairly common, but I know in Costa Rica, there's a, a park where they check your time when you go in and they check your time when you leave out. And based on, on, on that information, they can figure out, you know, if at any point your actual velocity was over a certain speed. And if it was, then they give you a ticket. Um, I want to do this last example. Oh, shoot. Uh, yeah. So this, this example is the um, closed interval method for finding absolute extrema on a given closed interval. This is from section 3.1. This is fair game. I like this because it uses a, it tests a couple of different concepts, you know, the extrema as well as critical points. So I think it's important for you to know the closed interval method. So here, remember the theory, we're, we're checking the Y values. We're checking the value of the function at the endpoints and at the critical points. So for critical points, of course, we need to take a derivative. And here it's a quotient, so you should think quotient rule. And so remember, it's important that you've memorized your quotient rule. If you don't know quotient rule, you know, that's not good. You have to memorize it. So take the denominator and square it. X minus four to the one half squared is just X minus four. Then in the numerator, take the original numerator, take its derivative and multiply that to the original denominator. So here I have one times X minus four to the one half. Then there's a minus sign. And now copy down the original numerator, which is X. And now we take a derivative of this original denominator here. And here, this is a composition. So you should use a chain rule. The outside function is something raised to the 1 half. So I have 1 half times X minus 4 to the minus 1 half. The derivative of the inside is just 1, so I didn't write it down. So this is the derivative part. It's the next step that I'm always curious, what's the student going to do? And it's all algebra. There's two options here. One, you can factor out the common term of the lowest power. Another way of doing that, you know, another way of thinking about it is I want to get rid of the denominator. This is a denominator here too. It's also something you might factor out because it's two to the negative one. And here, X minus four to the minus one half, that's a denominator. So I have two denominators two and x minus four to the one half. So let me get rid of those denominators by multiplying top and bottom by two times x minus four to the one half. Remember, this distributes, it gets multiplied to the second term, but it also gets multiplied to the first term. When we multiply it to the second term, all of these cancel. One half times two goes away, x minus four to the minus one half times x minus four to the one half, these terms disappear. The only term we're left with is x, which I've written down here. And then 2 times x minus 4 to the 1 half, we distribute to this first term, and it looks like 2 times x minus 4. So that algebraic simplification part, to me, is really important here, you know? So now you distribute and simplify. Now I get a nice expression where I can look at this and immediately tell you where this thing is 0 when x is equal to 8. And I can immediately tell you where it's undefined when x equals four. But I have to be careful for critical points have to be, in this case, the points I'm looking for need to be in the interval six to 12. So I've gotten the points four and eight, clearly four will not be included. So the derivative is zero at eight, derivative is undefined at four, but four is not in the domain. Here, the only critical point is eight. So now, I have to check the values. I have to plug it into the function. So when I plugged into the function, I got six over root two, okay? And then I plugged in this other function, I got 12 over root eight. When I plugged in this last one here, f of eight, I got four. So then 
I said, oh, I have to compare things to four. So then I rationalized the six over root two. So I multiplied top and bottom by root two. If you multiply top and bottom by root two, in the numerator, you get six root two divided by two. So here, six divided by two just gives me this three. And I rationalize the other function too. So remember, eight is the same as four times two. And so the square root of four times two, you can break up the square root, that's two times root two. And so now I think some argument should be given as to why you know, we know three root two is bigger than four. So for example, we know root two is approximately 1.4. Here's the argument I did, which is very mathy, and I'll finish this and stop. I said, well, three is the same as square root of nine. So I can write three root two as square root of nine times square root of two, which is square root of 18. And four, I can write as square root of 16. And now since 18 is bigger than 16 and squared is an increasing function, square root of 18 is bigger than square root of 16. Of course, you don't have to go to all this. You could say, I know root two is about 1.4, and so three times root two is bigger than four. But I think some justification should be given. So at this point, we know we found an absolute maximum value of three root two, and there are two absolute maximums, x equal to six and x equal to 12. And we have an absolute min value of four, and there's one absolute min at x equal to eight. So my, this is my time. Um, you should also look at this slide here, this next slide, and go over it. Um, the main thing, this would be the main argument here, that number one, we want continuity. So for differentiability, at the point x equal to 2, remember, we first need continuity. Continuity is a prerequisite for differentiability. So I'm checking the limits from the left and the right have to be equal. That gives me one equation. Then for differentiability, I need the derivative from the left and the right to be equal. So this part, you don't actually have to write it down like this. If you can just say even in words, we need the derivative from the left and the right at two to be equal. And then we take the actual derivative on the left here. You know, here's the derivative on the left. Here's the derivative on the right. Set those equal to each other. We get our second equation. We put these two equations together, we can find A and B. So all this mumbo jumbo that I wrote down here, you wouldn't necessarily need to write this limit stuff. If you could just say in words for differentiability at x equal to two, we need the derivative from the left to be equal to the derivative from the right. And then, you know, set those derivatives equal to each other. And here also all this stuff, I wrote this whole written explanation. You wouldn't need to include that. I've included that here because I want it to be explicit. This is a review that's supposed to, you know, explain stuff to the students. This would be more what you would have to write down for something like this. All right, folks. And so here's my final answer when I solve for A and B. So I'll just have you look, look at this slide and review this. All right, gang, that's my time. I'm going to stop right here.